Hi, this is Charlie Copeland, and you're watching a special section uh, segment of the Republican Hour. Uh, I come to, uh, to this station on the first and third Sundays of every month from 9 to 10, and uh, my guest uh, for this special segment is the Republican candidate for the United States Senate, Kevin Wade, uh, who's a good friend of mine I've known for a long, long time. He's been out there working hard for a long, long time. He's been very active. Uh, and he's a good guy, and what I really wanted was uh, to get uh, the community, our community around the city and Newcastle County to get to know Kevin, because I think it's important, as I've said on this program many, many times, to, uh, to judge the person, not necessarily the party, because Lord knows I know in, in, in my party I am a loyal Republican. I'm not always a proud Republican, but I am a loyal Republican. Uh, but there are great people in, in the Republican Party, and, and Kevin Wade is one of them, and I wanted you to get a chance to meet him. So, Kevin? Welcome to the program. Charlie, thanks for having me on. Sure. I'm glad to spend some time with you on a Sunday morning. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, many of the viewers uh, in and around the city and the, and the county, um, this may be their first introduction to you, uh, but that doesn't mean that you haven't been around doing a lot of things. Uh, it's just that you haven't necessarily been out touting it like, uh, like uh, grandstanders and people like that. So uh, tell a little bit about, uh, about Kevin Wade. Well, Charlie, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I was raised not to grandstand, not to not to uh, get on on a uh, on a, a soapbox and start beating my chest. I was trained to uh, write by my mother just to to do my job as well as I could and try to carry a good name uh, through the rest of my life. I uh, have lived in Delaware since I was 20 years old. Which, if you look at how gray my hair five is, five years that's, ago. That's about five years ago, Charlie. <laughs> uh, I run a small engineering business. And we've been uh, in operation for about 30 years now. And we fix problems. We've done work with the largest companies in the country and around the world, as well as many small companies. And uh, my wife and I have raised a daughter up to, to now she's 25, married to a good man in her own right, uh, two beautiful grandchildren. And uh, life, uh, life has been good. I'm not a wealthy man in the ways of money, but important things in life. Well, my wife and I have worked very hard to, to put together a good life. But I looked up from all the clanging clutter of my work several years ago. And what I saw around me uh, in the neighborhoods of Delaware and in the neighborhoods across America, well, it made me sick. I saw that the work that, that so many of us have done for so long has been, has really been squandered by the bad hands of well, professional politicians in Washington who, who don't understand how much work it is to, to raise a family and to earn a dollar and to pay those bills. So I thought I'd get involved and just lend a hand with, well, frankly, Republican candidates doing things like blowing up balloons and I putting think up yard signs. <laughs> Republican <laughs> candidates need all the help we can and get. And I may, state. frankly, don't quote me, I will have to edit this, I may have helped a Democrat along <laughs> the way or two, but, but here in Delaware you judge the person as, you, right. as you open. That's right. I'm not, uh, I'm not a country club Republican, no offense to people who belong to country clubs, I've visited once or twice myself, but... Uh, <laughs> By the way, I am, and, and, and I have been blessed, but that's, you know, that doesn't And, and mean we're friends, <laughs> fans, if you're white, we're friends. It's a big we are. It's a big tent party. That's right. But uh, I grew up on the harsher side of life in a factory town, to give you a bit of a background. I uh, grew up in the harsher side of life in a factory town in Pennsylvania. And I've uh, told many groups when I speak to them uh, uh, in a room that uh, on cold winter nights, on cold winter nights, not only would there be ice on the outside of the bedroom window, the bedroom that I shared with my brother, on the third floor of a row house, not much different than you find in Wilmington, but there would be ice on the, on the inside of right, the window, right, right. on the inside. And I'd yell downstairs to my mom, I said, Mom, send up some more heat. And she'd respond, Nope, I'm saving it for the girls. And she was right, as she almost always was. Uh, to give you a sense for knowing the value of a dollar, Charlie, my mother would take in sewing. And she would sit by a table lamp late in the evening sewing others, other people's clothing to let down a hem or bring up a hem or replace a zip or do something with the waist. And she would charge one dollar for each piece she worked on. Mm -hmm. Now, she had a day job in an office as well, but there were four of us, and my father wasn't in the picture, and, and life was... Uh, Life was a challenge every single day. So for some extra money, she'd do sewing. And I remember her sitting up so late for one dollar a piece. So that really taught me the value of a dollar. Right. I uh, had the good fortune 
I had the good fortune back in those days to go to work in a steel mill a few days after high school. And I went quickly from being a high school boy to a hard working man. And, and in that mill, they, the other men had really no regard for my self esteem. It was, son, if you want to cash a check, you've got to do the work. Right. And it was a hard work, and it was dirty work, and it was noisy, but it was a good paycheck. You see, you could come out of a row house and move into a job at the age of 18 and earn a good paycheck and get that first, that first handhold on the oh, yeah. ladder of opportunity. Yep. And I began to uh, go to work, uh, actually go to school uh, at night when I wasn't in the mill. And a few years later, I was lucky enough to, uh, to come to Delaware and take a job with what was then called DuPont's Engineering Department mm -hmm. uh, in its full flower right. back in the day. Yeah. And I continued to go to school at night at the University of Delaware, eventually getting my own engineering degree, uh, electrical engineering. And uh, in my many travels for DuPont, I've told audiences I used to travel distant places to fix things that other DuPont engineers had broken. Uh, in my travels coming back one Friday evening, I had the great fortune of meeting this beautiful young uh, registered nurse who was working at the DuPont hospital at the time, and we struck up a conversation in the shuttle bus. A year and a half later, we were married, and we're still married 34 years later. Ah, good for you. So, so the good things in my life yeah. have taken place right here in Delaware, and Delaware has been very good to me. It's given me a place to, well, be myself, mm -hmm. to be someone. And uh, we've raised a family, and now we have grandchildren. And I looked around one day, as I started earlier, and, and I saw what was happening, what was happening in our country. You know, I've been busy growing a business, and I know, right. you, I know you have a small business, you've yep. been saying. absolutely. And you're raising a family, and you're cutting the grass, and you're fixing the leaky roofs. And you think that the folks in Washington who we have hired, right, right are doing, doing the job, right thing. In the same way that we're doing a job, mm -hmm. that they're doing the right thing. The same way a cab driver does a good job, or a pipe fitter, or an electrician, or a bookkeeper, or a school teacher. But you look closely, and this isn't right. You see, the money that we work so hard to earn, that's the basis for putting food on the table, for paying the rent, for setting something aside to buy a house. The money that we work so hard to earn and save $10 and $20 and $50 at a time, Washington just wastes by the millions, mm -hmm. by the millions and millions. And I came to the conclusion that, well, the reason it doesn't bother them, Charlie, is because it's not their yeah. money. Yeah, other people's money. But we have an expression in my small business, you can't spend the same dollar twice. Yeah. So you better think twice before spending it once. And uh, I think what we need in Washington, and basically the, the single uh, campaign message that I'm carrying across the state, is uh, we need to bring common sense to Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, common sense to Washington would be a, a, a fundamental change. Uh, you know, the individual you're running against, uh, uh, Tom Carper, he first got elected into office in 1976. 1976, when I was 13 years old. I am no longer 13 years old. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is by definition a career politician. Somebody who, frankly, has not had to hire people, make a, make a payroll, uh, look a bank uh, loan officer in the eye and say, yes, I'm going to return this money to you if you invest in me. Uh, hasn't had to look at somebody during a hard economic time and say, we've got to make a decision. Are we going to uh, invest in the business? Are we going to not invest in the business? Are we not going to, 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 to you know, buy a new car? Are we going to, you know, we're going to make tough decisions. Where are we going to send our kids to school? And he hasn't had to make those tough decisions because he's been on the, on the government payroll the entire time. Well, Charlie, to put a time stamp on, on, on his start on the taxpayer payroll, uh, in that year, uh, Disco Inferno by the Tramps was on the top 40 charts. Right. Oh, yeah, okay. Burn, baby, burn. And, uh, and some are humming it right now. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and American Motors had a Gremlin that was selling well in the show. Yeah, rooms. the AMC Gremlin. Okay, but, but times have gone on. Times have, have moved forward. We're yeah. faced with yeah. different challenges now. In, in, in those days, 35 years ago, this country was the most prosperous nation in the history of the planet. By n bar none. I mean, it was way, oh, absolutely. There was no number two. Yeah, oh yeah. We had lapped the rest of the world, you know, to use yeah. NASCAR speak. 
And today we're the world's largest debtor nation, but still the spending continues. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this past summer, the nation's the best way to express it is the nation's credit score has been dropped for the first time in our history. Right. And still the spending continues. I've had to make decisions running a small business. You have many people watching today have worked in small businesses or run small businesses. You have to make daily decisions in order to, well, satisfy the needs of your customers, satisfy the needs of your community. But in Washington, where money has no value because it's other people's money, if a program fails, if it doesn't meet the needs of a community, instead of rethinking it and rebuilding it and fixing what's broken so you can better meet the needs of the community, Washington just adds more budget to it next Keeps year. Keeps it going. It's like they're like zombies in a Hollywood movie. They never go away. Right. <laughs> but, but the zombies, if you remember the Hollywood movies, they don't, they don't work that well. And neither do many of our programs. And, and the failures of these programs fall, well, most heavily on well, people from the neighborhoods I came from, the right, row houses. Right. The row houses. Well, because the powerful and connected are always going to get theirs, which is why the banks got bailed out, which is why the insurance companies got bailed out, while why uh, the Federal Reserve just keeps printing money to keep the banks afloat. Uh, because, and meanwhile, homeowners are stuck in homes that, that are now underwater. Uh, and, and jobs, despite what, what the newspaper might say about the unemployment rate, I can tell you right now, as a small business owner and as a guy with a lot of friends in the community, the unemployment rate in and around the city of Wilmington is in, in significant double digits, whether that's 15%, 25%, or 35%, depends on your age bracket, but uh, jobs are hard to find. And, and, and that, uh, you, you just, the policies we're following isn't solving that issue. And, and what do you say to someone who's 18 years old who isn't going to find a job this year, and he's not going to find it next year? He can't what, do what you did, which was get out of high school and say, there's a steel mill. There's a steel mill. Let me in. It's hard work, but it's a paycheck, and there's a chance to climb the right. ladder. Right. The ladder has been scrapped out and sent to China in too many cases. Mm -hmm. You know that. I know that. It's the Tom Carpers of the world who don't. Because and that's hanging, why we have to make the change. They're hanging out in Washington, and yeah, they come back here and they go to the, to, to the gym and make a speech, or they go to the dinner and they make a speech. But the bottom line is they, they, they spend their time in the halls of Washington, where the only people they see are other elected officials or lobbyists, and the lobbyists are all wearing nice three-piece suits, uh, and there's a total disconnect with what's really going on in the economy that somebody like you, who has lived through it, pulled themselves up, started a business, run a business, uh, had to make tough decisions as to what I'm going to spend money on today, where do I need to save money so that I can make it to next year. Uh, and, and a lot of people watching this show, they, whether they've ever had a small business or not, they are on a limited budget, and they've got to make tough decisions. What am I going to get at the grocery store today because I've only got limited income and I've got to make it to next week when I get that next check? Well, Charlie, everyone in this country and all of our viewers this morning are on a limited budget. All of us. The only ones in this country not on a limited budget are those folks who govern in Washington. Now, speaking of budgets, I mean, you have a budget at home. Mm -hmm. I have a budget at home. The U.S. Senate hasn't passed a budget in over 1,000 days. Now, just think of that. Right. There it's are almost three th years. The Constitution actually provides for few duties for the U.S. Senate, but one is pass a budget. Pass a budget, and it's been over a thousand days. So Tom Carper has been going down to the Senate now for a number of years, and has failed to vote on a budget for the United States as to what we should spend. To set the priorities, have a national discussion. Even if a budget is not well thought out, even if it's something that we truly can't afford, at least go through the motions of meeting the right. requirements of, of the office, which right. is to pass a budget. Right. Now, most of us in Delaware are fairly common sense people. Unfortunately, our senior senator, Tom Carper, when votes come up in Washington, 94% of the time he votes with the Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi agenda. Right. Uh, I believe Senator Boxer from California votes 96% of the time. Right. So our senior senator will talk to people in Delaware this summer about, about being an independent voice, Charlie, right. an independent voice for Delaware. 
But when you're just behind Senator Boxer from California in your voting patterns, right. where's the independence? Unfortunately, he is just another career politician. But we can't afford that any longer. Our nation is hurting. So, so basically, if, if I, if I to, to understand what you're saying about his voting record, it, it seems to me that, that you want somebody that goes down to Washington, and, and, and there's nobody in the world uh, except my wife, of course, that I agree with 100% of the time. <laughs> well put, Charlie. And, uh, <laughs> and she'll even say that uh, I don't always agree with her, but eventually I do what she says. So, uh, but you know, if you're vote, if you're agreeing with somebody else 96, 97% of the time, you're not actually going down there and making an individual Delaware-based decision. You're not looking at the issue, saying what's good for Delaware, what's good for the country. You're saying, what does my leadership want me to do? You're, you're basically saying he's not an independent, he's not being independently minded. He's just doing what he's sort of told to do or what the, the, the club that he's in has decided to do. It appears that Senator Harry Reid is his boss, <laughs> when in fact it should be the people of Delaware. Now, we need to make tough decisions as a people. Last month, 40 cents of every dollar the federal government spent was money borrowed, and some of it was borrowed from foreign hands. And that means 40 cents of every dollar that our seniors received as a Social Security check was paid with borrowed money. I have a, a niece whose husband is serving in Kabul right now. Last month, 40 cents of every dollar he received in pay and benefits was money that was borrowed, some from foreign hands. It, it can't continue. We have to make real choices. We have real needs. We have to keep the commitment to our seniors. But we can't ask the Chinese to keep that commitment. Right. We have to. Right. We have to provide a ladder of opportunity for our 18-year-olds and our 19-year-olds. That's not for China to do. Right. That's for we the people to do. We really have to get together and talk about the tough challenges before all of us. So we build a consensus and we take, well, Delaware's solution down to Washington. I'm asking the voters here in Newcastle County to allow me to be Delaware's voice in Washington. For mm -hmm. too long, we've had Washington's man right. in Delaware, and that can't continue. Right. And, and, and you know, you, you, you look around the community, and you look at, at the young people who are coming out of our schools with a, a lousy education, fourth grade, fifth grade level education. And then you look at the fact that the GM plant has closed and the Chrysler plant has closed. And what do we replace them with? We replace them with Fisker Automotive, which has now laid everybody off. And it looks increasingly less likely that they will ever build a vehicle there. And we replace Chrysler with, uh, with Bloom Energy, a, a venture capital, wealth-based company out of California with no real market or product, uh, giving higher energy costs, which are being driven through Delmarva Power. And everybody listening to this right now, unless you live in, in one of the, the municipalities like Middletown or something like that, you are a Delmarva user. You're paying to create Bloom Energy, to subsidize venture capital investors from California. Uh, and, and so we're taking all this money that could be either left in the economy or it could be used to help you know, our senior citizens uh, with Social Security increases and, and, and Medicare uh, payments and things like that. Or it, it but instead we're, we're spending it on, on well-connected, powerful people in other parts of the world, China uh, and, and places in Asia, and, and then well-connected, powerful bankers and investors in other states. Well, well, Charlie, the fancy word for that is crony capitalism. See, real capitalism is, is, is a freedom to choose. You can buy pizza at, at this pizza parlor or walk three more streets up and, and buy it there. You choose where to get your pizza, where to use your money. That's, uh, that's the basis of our economy here, that the, the shop owner has to compete for, for your business and you make wise choices. But under crony capitalism, it's this distortion of what the free market is. It's where people in powerful places can, can kind of give rewards to, to well-connected friends. And these aren't rewards paid out of their own pocket. The problem, Charlie, is these rewards, these favors, are paid for by everyone in Delaware. Right. And that's what's wrong. And that has to end. Right. And, and I think that's, that's part of what, I, you know, in, in, in my you know, years of getting to know you and in talking about 
public policy and politics and what's going on with Delaware. Uh, I think that, that, that passion that you had for, hey, look, I, I came out of a hardworking family and I went, I worked in a tough industry and I went to school at night and I dragged myself up and I pulled myself hand over hand, rung over rung, and I'm looking around and I'm seeing the field isn't level anymore. That guys like me who come out of, you know, a tough, hardworking American families that are, we're, we're, we, we can't succeed anymore because all these other powerful folks have gotten into the pockets of the elected official in Washington and shut down what was the economic engine of the world. It worked so well for over 200 years, but the heavy hand of Washington just played one card too many. And our economy is unwinding. We have to really get together as a people. This isn't an, an our thing. I mean, I've, I've told audiences. Yeah, now, I'm the Repu let me say that I am the Republican candidate. candidate for the U.S. Senate, but I'm not here to talk about the Republican Party. Right. I'm not here to talk about the past, good or bad. Right. And I'm surely not here to talk about the Democrat Party. We have to talk about who we are as a people and what we give to the next generation. You see, the 18 and 19-year-olds, they need to get on that ladder of opportunity. They need to move into their own life. They can't be waiting around for someone else in Washington to decide what, well, what they're permitted right. to do. Right. Food stamps was no one's career program. We need to find a way to unleash the natural creativity and hard work of the folks who are watching this show this morning. Well, you know, you look, at, you look in the city and, and if you own a, a, a home and you say, you know, I'd like to start uh, an internet business out of here, developing web pages, or I want to start a carpentry shop or a bicycle shop or any one of these sort of small businesses, you can't do it. And if you can't take what you own and use that to make money for yourself, to take care of yourself, then you're stuck relying on somebody else. And, and, and what has happened over the years is that, that our education system continues to get worse. The, the, the people who, who control the education system invest less and less in the city of Wilmington. The employers in the city of Wilmington say, well, I don't have an educated workforce, so I'm going to bring people from outside, or I'm going to move out. And, and you can see it all around in, in, in the vacancy, in the unemployment rate, and in the opportunities. And, and I, frankly, I, I, I take a very moralistic view of it that, that what we are doing is, is you know, borders on immoral, that we're taking good, hardworking Americans who deserve just as much opportunity as anybody else. And we have eliminated that opportunity because we've put this government bureaucracy in there that now dictates everything that you do starting in the morning, how much your water is going to cost when it comes out of the faucet, what you're going to pay on your power bill so that we can pay some guy out in California for his subsidy, what we're going to charge you for your taxes so you can pay for a school that's being built in another community. I mean, it's just wrong. It is wrong. It is wrong. Uh, and these are different variations of crony capitalism. Yes. We take the ratepayers' money for electricity, and it's routed by the state government, okay, by Governor Markell, let's be clear, into the hands of Bloom Energy, which is owned by folks on the West Coast, to make jobs for people, well, in, in, in California. Right. There will be some jobs created in Delaware. Some. But look at the price we pay for this. We have tax incentives to bring uh, outside companies into Delaware, and they proceed to uh, basically buy homes in Pennsylvania or Maryland right. uh, and live their own lives there. So we're helping people not from Delaware, but we're using Delaware taxpayer money. Right. And at some point, the folks in Dover and the folks down in Washington, they actually have to clear it with us. You see, we, we've all woken up, okay? We, we raised our head. We raised our head, we stopped cutting the grass and fixing the leaky roof to see what's happening in our neighborhoods. And now that we've seen, we have to stand together and go to work at fixing right. it. We deserve better than this, Charlie. Uh, absolutely. And, and so anyway, I, the, you know, you've been hearing from Kevin Wade, who's the Republican U.S. Senate candidate uh, this year. And, and I've come on the show and I can, will continue to. To, to say, look at the individual, look at the person, not the party, and decide what's the right thing for the state of Delaware uh, in, in our elected officials that go to Washington, our elected officials that go to Dover, our elected officials that go to Newcastle County Council, and our elected officials that go to the city of Wilmington. I think that Kevin Wade is an excellent choice to turn what is a 35-year guy who's been in government 
into a, a, a new seat, somebody that can bring new ideas, new thoughts, and new energy uh, to what is a stagnant uh, and decaying government, frankly, in, in Washington. And Kevin, we're coming to the end. Uh, I wanted to thank you. I don't know if you have any last thing you wanted to say. Well, we didn't have enough time to cover everything that I would love to talk about, but I would like you to visit the website, which is www.wade4ussenate.com. Lots of videos, lots of pictures. Send a comment, and we're always looking for volunteers. God bless you. What's that again? What's the, that the was website? wade4ussenate.com. Thank you very much. Oh, absolutely. Kevin Wade, ladies and gentlemen.